Where? Around the bend. They got the beautiful lady with them? Nah, she's tied up somewhere. We gotta save her, Jim. You're right, Ed. We gotta save her. Shh, quiet. I can hear them coming. They're coming! At War. Tonight, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Consul on Books in Wartime, attempts to tell a part of the story of what we in our war have done to the children of the world. Tonight's drama is based on the important new book by Otto Zoff, entitled, They Shall Inherit the Earth. The part of the author will be played by Richard Stark. Bang, bang, bang! You're dead, Dirty Dan, you're dead! There, Texas Jim, we just killed Dirty Dan and all his cattle rustlers. We done a good job. Yeah, Buffalo Ed, we done a good... Bang, 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 bang. What are you doing? Dirty Dan wasn't dead yet. He was still flopping. Hey, you're standing on my horse's head. Hey, Jimmy, get off Mom's broom. Excuse me. Where's mine? Right here. Come on, Texas, we got a ride. Yeah. The beautiful lady's still tied up on the railroad tracks. We gotta save her. Come on, old Pete. Get in here. Are those words at war? No. No, they're not. They're just the words of some little boys playing a game in a small town in the eastern part of the United States of America. It's the summer of 1937. At this same time, in Madrid, Spain... But perhaps I'd better tell you who I am. My name is Otto Zoff, and for years... I've been gathering material for a book that would answer the question, what are we doing to the children of the world? And so I walked through many countries. I saw and spoke with children, the militarized children of Mussolini's regime in Italy, the German boys and girls educated to hate under the Nazi rule, the children of Spain. In 1939, I saw the children of Spain. Back in 1937, while American children were playing cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians, children in Spain were being bombed to death. There was a man in Madrid, a simple, quiet man, a librarian, I believe. But it doesn't matter what he was. What does matter is what he said. I have seen so many things, Mr. Zoff. Day after day, the fascist troops lay in the miserable tenements of the workers' quarters. They lurked at the windows of the houses and starved people out across the way. The troops would stay very still, waiting for thirst and hunger to provide them a target. At last, a woman would appear fearfully at one of the doorways, planning to go out and get her family something to eat. She looks around. There is nothing. She pulls a child after her by one hand, a second child by the other. She is not going to risk leaving the children alone there with her husband. He might get killed in the fight at any moment. She looks around again. Everything is quiet. She says to herself, I'll just risk it. Be right back. And so she goes out with the children, slipping along between the rows of tenements and... Now it is time to throw the grenade. And so they threw the grenade. But why not? Those fascists had been cooped up in that house a long time. They needed the practice. Is it known how many children died in the Civil War? Yes, it is known precisely. 10,699. And wounded? 15,320. You... you know it by heart? Yes, I know it by heart. There is one thing, though, Mr. Zoff. One consolation. What's that? Nothing else ever will seem brutal to you compared with this. My friend from Madrid was wrong. 
Many times during the next years, I saw things of indescribable brutality, things happening to children. You know of those things. You've read about them in the newspapers, seen them in the newsreels. But what has it meant? When hundreds of thousands of children are in danger, they become statistics. We see them as figures and graphs printed black on white paper, not as little boys and girls, burned, bleeding, starving, tortured, abandoned to despair. So we sit quiet and motionless in our comfortable homes, knowing with our minds, but not believing with our hearts, that there are thousands of children weeping and bleeding all over the world. It's 1941 now, and the two fires begun in China and Spain have ignited the world. Belgium has fallen, Holland, Norway, France, even America is now at war. What about the children of America? Are they still playing games? Oh, yes. Different games, of course. But they're playing games. They're not being murdered and... You see, through a happy circumstance of geography, American children are still allowed the privilege of childhood. I'm a Nazi. I'm a terrible, dirty Nazi. I'll kill all the terrible people in the world. All the terrible people in the world. Bang, you're dead. Bang, you too. Bang, 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 bang. You're all dead. Boom, boom. You're dead, you old Nazi. Huh? I just hit you with a mortar. You're a Nazi and you're dead. I ain't no Nazi. Sure you are. You just said you was. I heard you. I was saying it private. Out loud, I ain't. Go on. <laughs> There, I just cut you in two in the middle, and all your insides is gushing out. I ain't gonna play. My dad says the worst thing can happen to a man is to be a Nazi or a Jack. Nothing wrong with being a Nazi when you're playing. It's just when you grow up, you gotta watch yourself. When I grow up, I'm gonna be a... a, a... What? I don't know. I'm gonna be a first lieutenant like my dad and have a thousand millimeter gun. What's that? I don't know exactly, but it takes a hundred men to make a shoot. My dad gives them all orders. He says, see that German over there? Shoot his head off. And they do. I know what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a streetcar conductor. Yeah, yeah, that's okay, too. But I think I'd rather be a general. The uniforms is better. What are you going to be when you grow up? Every child the world over has been asked that question. He makes a game of it. Not German children, though. They are asked the question, but it's not a game. It's another way of instilling in them the Nazi doctrine. I shall grow up to be a member of the Schwarzer Kurs, like my father, sir. Good. Hans? I shall be a member of the elite guard, like my father. And what else? And give my life for my Fuhrer, of course. Right. Rudy? I shall grow up to be a member of Herr Göring's Air Force, like my father. Heil Hitler! Walter! I shall go up to be a member of Herr Goering's Air Force. Yeah. Like my... Order! I will have order in this class. Now, Walter, you were saying... I shall go, go up to be... No, I won't, I won't! Boys, be quiet! Give Walter a chance to tell us about himself. Come now, Walter, don't be bashful. We are all so interested in your future ambitions. You were taught what to say. Say it! I shall go up to be hanged like my father because I am a Jew. Heil Hitler. What have we done to the children of the world? Something has occurred that's beyond man's ability to grasp. The earth is not changed. The seasons pass in their appointed cycle. Life and death still keep their secrets. And each living creature broods over his final breath. But the children, what have we done to them? This. In cold blood, the whole world has turned to systematic murder. Children have been condemned to starvation, torture, bombardment. They've been orphaned, mutilated, killed. Why? For tactical reasons. What are they like, then, these military objectives? These youngsters who will... Inherit the earth. 
All over the globe, children are touched by fascism and war. They stagger down the endless roads of China under the bombs of Japanese planes. In Japan, they are taught to die for the emperor. In Germany, they're taught how to hate. They starve on the streets of Athens and Madrid. They huddle in the ruins of Warsaw. They learn the ways of sabotage and murder under the very noses of the victorious Germans in France, Holland, Norway, Greece, Denmark, Yugoslavia. And in Russia, they fight. Children. We're speaking of children. What have we done to them? Mom! Hey, Mom! Supper ready yet? Almost. Wash your hands, Edmund. Okay. What we got? Well, first we have soup. Wash your hands, dear. Don't just run them through the water. Okay. Vegetable soup? Vegetable soup. Oh, not the dish towel, son. Get a hand towel. It's the summer of 1943. America has been at war for almost two years. The home life in America has been affected, of course. There are inconveniences, scarcities. And in some homes, tragedy has come. However, the boys and girls in America do get enough to eat. In France, at this very moment, a little boy and his sister, Pierre and Marie Ducor, are starving to death. Meanwhile... Boy, wouldn't Pop like this baked ham? Mom, when's Dad coming home? When the war's over, dear. When the war's over, you're dead. Take your hand out of the soup. Your dad will come home and we'll go to picnics the way we used to and... Edmund, take your hand out of the soup. It's not in. Look, I'm holding it an inch up. I'm feeling the steam. See, Mom? Look, look, Mom. Yes, I'm looking. I want you to sit down at your place now. Okay. Mom? Yes, dear? Mom, what are wars for? I believe wars are fought so there will be equal justice for all of the people in the world. What's justice? <laughs> Edmund, your question. She don't know what justice is. Mom doesn't know what justice is. Y'all Edmund, don't know what justice settle down is. now. Now then, supposing we say justice is fairness. Fairness? How? Well... Now, suppose you and Jimmy Adams were each entitled to one piece of candy. However, Jimmy takes two, so you get none. Now, that wouldn't be fair, would it? No. Could I fight him, then? Not at all. You talk it over. You know, Mom, I think I'll declare war on Jimmy tomorrow. He's got a baseball and I ain't. You'll do no such thing. If I hear of you fighting with Jimmy Adams, I'll spank you. Okay. Mom, can I go fight with Dad? Of course. Of course not. Come now, here's your bowl of soup. Eat it before it gets cold. Mmm, smells good. Why can't I go fight? Because you're too little. War is not for children. It isn't? Certainly not. War has nothing to do with children. Now eat your soup. Marie, eat your bread. I don't want to. Pierre, I'm hungry. Really hungry. Then eat your bread. I can't. It's got a ram in it. Where? Right here, see? A big ram crawling. Just a minute. There. I killed it. Where is it? It's gone. I killed it. Marie, eat your bread. Yes, Pierre. Eat your soup, Edmund. I am. Mom... Are there going to be any more wars after this one? I don't know, son. Maybe if they got someone to stop them the way you stopped Jimmy and me from fighting, there wouldn't be any. Maybe. Does anybody know if there'll be any more wars? Well, we all hope and pray there won't be. Sure, prayers is okay. But I think machine guns is safer. I'm going to hope and pray for a machine gun. A machine gun? Will the German shoot us with a machine gun if we go? No, of course not. Why can't we go then? I told you, Marie. 
A good Frenchman doesn't take food handed out by a Nazi. I'm not a good Frenchman. I'm hungry. I know, Marie. Don't think about it. Think about the piece of bread. It had a worm in it. Listen, Marie. The Nazis would only give us greasy water, and they'd say it was soup, and they'd laugh at us. And besides, Mother and Father wouldn't like it. Pierre, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Please don't cry, Marie. <coughs> Look, I'll tell you the pretend dinner. The pretend dinner? Will you promise to go slow and tell everything? I promise. Ready? Mm-hmm. Go slow. We'll see a big dinner place. No, you skipped. Start at the beginning. All right. We'll be walking down the street, hand in hand, hand in hand, and we'll see a big dinner place. And it'll be warm, and the chairs will all be made of pink velvet. And this is what we'll have to eat. Now go slow. Tell it slow. First, we'll have two potatoes. Two a piece. Two a piece. And then we、we'll、each have twenty-five raspberries. That cost forty francs. Fifty-five francs for twenty-five raspberries. It says so in the window of the store on the corner. That's too much. We'll have plums instead. And then we'll have a loaf of bread. Please, Pierre. I don't want any bread. I'm hungry. My stomach's tired, and I'm hungry. Don't cry. Listen, Marie. <laughs> Listen. For dessert, you can have a pear, all to yourself. I can. When? When can I have these things? I don't know, Marie. I don't know. A story? No, no, this isn't a story. It's true. But where are these children now? We should know. They're to inherit the earth. Remember? They won't, though. Marie won't. She caught cold one day and died within three hours. She was so undernourished, you see. Pierre won't either. He's dead too. Dead of starvation. And the others, the countless others. I saw you on the roads, my little French friends, on the roads leading south from Paris. Those roads that were worn down, broken up, walked to pieces by the flight of ten million panic-driven people. Those roads that were sown with wounded and dying, with blood and machine gun bullets. I saw you, little French children, hungry, weary, lonely. On wind-driven Paris streets, where are you now? I don't know. The little we hear tells only of a tiny handful out of countless millions. Let eleven-year-old Mary, who lived in Poland, tell you her story. We lived in a tiny village. We had a little house, and behind it was an orchard, and a pond for the geese and ducks. On the other side of a pond stood stood the neighbor's house. They had a garden too, and in their garden they had carrots. Mother always said, "You mustn't go over there and eat their carrots. That isn't nice." But one day, I thought Mother wouldn't see me if I crawled through the hedge and and made myself little, so I wouldn't show much. You see. Those carrots look so good. I couldn't help doing it. I pulled up one, and another, and another. I ate them. I washed them in the in the pond and ate them. I didn't hear anything or or see anything until suddenly there was a big crash, and I nearly fell in the water. When I got up, I was terribly scared. And I looked at our house, and it wasn't there anymore. My mother wasn't there either. A child knows not the meaning of the word insecurity. He doesn't know the meaning, but he shudders at the fact. Before Pearl Harbor, 
America's children were the children of a continent of peace. Now, however, though the children do not see much of war, they hear of it incessantly. War is hell. War is death and destruction. Everyone who can't defend himself goes under. We must learn to hate. And as hate walks through a child's mind, with it walks its companion, fear. And I'm going to kill all the people in the world. All the people in the world. Boom, you're dead. Boom, boom. I'll pull their eyes out and stick them in a garbage and put the top on. And then when the Germans come, I'll reconnaissance and then I'll kill them all. Terrible hero, and I'm going to kill all... is that you? Yes, sir, Mrs. Smith. Is Eddie home? Home? Good heavens, child, he's been asleep for hours. It's after ten o'clock. Why aren't you home in bed? I, I, I was, but three Germans come through the ceiling and... and, and then... minute, Jimmy, I'll open the door for you. Now, Jimmy... Tell me, what on earth? Where's your mother, dear? Mommy's on the night shift at the factory this week, and Daddy had to go out of town, so she put me to bed and wet. She said she had a punch of clock. She said it was all right until the Nazis came. Right through the ceiling they came, and I ran, and, and, and look, Mrs. Smith, I hurt my knee, and I fell, and my knee's all bloody, and it hurts. <laughs> my knee hurts. Come here, Jimmy, over to the light. Now, let's see. Why, child, your knee's all right. It's not even skin. Yes, it is, too. And I don't want to go home. Nazis are waiting for me behind all the doors with mortars and submarines. Tell you what, Jimmy. You stay here for the night. (laughs) I'll go over and leave a note for your mother. You can sleep in the other bed in Edmund's room. And won't he be surprised when he wakes up in the morning and finds you there? (laughs) I don't have to go home? No. Okay. You know, Mrs. Smith, I wasn't really afraid. It's just that they were real big and they growled at me and I was there all by myself. He was there all by himself. How many American children are left by themselves these days? You've heard a number of stories tonight. Stories telling of the fears, the persecutions, the sufferings of little boys and girls in this our war. We've spoken of the children's sufferings, but as yet, we have not told of their bravery, of the sublime courage and indomitable will to live of all children. It happened in London during the darkest period of the war, and it seemed only a matter of weeks before England would be invaded. The warning siren had sounded, and youngsters from a nearby school had gathered in an air raid shelter before the first enemy planes arrived overhead. Come now, sit down. Everyone sit down. I sit next to Emily. It's my turn to sit next to Emily. Get up, Peter. Oh, all right. Tell us a story, Emily. Yes, tell us a story. All right, but you must be quiet first. Everybody shut up. Go ahead, Emily. We're quiet. But I have no more stories. I've told you them all. Oh, Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I shall think of something. Shall I tell you of the time I took my sister Jane to the fair? Oh, yes, tell us yes, the fair. Yes, tell us the fair. Right, please, sit down. down. Please, Emily. I hear bombs. Emily, they're dropping bombs on us. Yes, Peter, I know. Now the story. When Jane was only four, we went to the fair. It was wonderful. There were booths with ducks to shoot at and sugar spun candy and clowns. Clowns? Oh, yes. Three clowns in gay costumes with their faces all painted into smiles. And they turned cartwheels around us, right in a circle around us. And Jane was afraid and grabbed hold of my arm and said, Emily, I'm frightened. I want to go home. She was afraid of clowns? I know it was strange. But then she was a very little girl. She said, Emily, I'm frightened. I want to go home. And I said, don't be frightened, Jane. They're only clowns. And then what? Emily, you 
think the bonds can get through? Oh, no, dear, of course not. Go on, Emily. What should you and Jane do then? Well, then, and this is the best part, we saw a band concert, a military band, and the leader looked perfectly beautiful. He wore white trousers and a scarlet coat, and on his head he had a very handsome fur hat. And as he marched out to lead his band, as he marched out so tall and straight, he slipped and sat right down on his handsome head. <laughs> got right up, carefully dusted off his hat, turned round, bowed to the audience, turned round and fell down again. <laughs> oh, you mustn't cry. The bombs can't possibly get through the shelter. You know that. It's the Nazis. They want to kill us. The Nazis are trying to kill us. shall inherit the earth. What have we to say to them? What have we to say to the children of China, Russia, Poland, England, to the children of the world? Only this, we will help you. There are only a few who know of your need, but more and more will learn. And those of you who are starving, we'll feed. And those who are lost, we'll find. This we promise. Meanwhile, wait and have faith. The day of victory will come. And on that day, we'll begin mankind's new effort to have trust in itself. We've always failed up to now, haven't we, children? But have faith. For one day, you are going to inherit our old struggle to trust one another. And when you do, children... Remember this, so long as man can believe in man, there's still a chance for all of us. As the 30th program of Words at War, we have brought you a program based on the book They Shall Inherit the Earth by Otto Zoff. The book was adapted for radio by Edith Sommer. Richard Stark narrated for Otto Zoff. The original music was by William Meter, and the production was under the direction of Frank Papp. Words at War will present an adaptation of another outstanding war book. Words at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. This is the National Broadcasting Company.